in your slot. Welcome to this week's session of Change 11. Our guest this week and the, the head of the talk and the guiding of the drawing is Nancy White, who's come, been kind enough to devote some of her time this week to lead the session. Um, as she says, uh, the change is one of those things that's hard to be prepared for. So for those of you who are wondering what our week is about, uh, we've got an opening. You can click on that at fullcirc.com. Um, Nancy White is uh, facilitator and a community organizer and a lot of really wonderful things that I will do a terrible job describing. But if you go to her blog and look around, you'll get a sense of all the, the cool and interesting and wonderful things she does do. And uh, she is very much one of my idols, so I always look forward to getting a chance to chat with her and uh, you know, take a really different perspective. We tried to invite as many different voices to Change 11 as we could to come from different sort of angles. And Nancy's not strictly an education person per se but certainly teaches a lot of people a lot of stuff. So I'd like to thank you very, very much for sparing the time for us, Nancy. And uh, welcome aboard. Thanks, Dave. And and when you if you come up with a one-liner of what I do, my mother would deeply appreciate it. Um, we, we've had uh, problems with this. And my youngest son, though, did give me a description based on something I did uh, years ago. In um, 2000, 2001, I was doing some work in Central Asia in uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia. And I was working with a really tiny, tiny NGO based in Vermont, which they jokingly said was made up of old Vermont retired farmers, which in many cases was actually true. And they, were, they had this grant to use the Internet to connect small and medium enterprise businesses in the region, which had 5% Internet connectivity. So you know at the beginning this whole thing was an outlandish dream of being like, what is this? And it was amazing because we, I went to Azerbaijan and jet lagged and driving across Azerbaijan into Georgia to Tbilisi, which border crossing itself is worth the whole story. Um, and uh, this is where I actually was mistaken for a prostitute. So you can tell it was a very interesting story. But um, we get to Georgia and we get to Tbilisi. And this is the first week Tbilisi had electricity after months and months of only having generator-based electricity and literally people tearing down their houses and burning their furniture to keep warm. Only mistaken was Jeffrey, that's right, only being mistaken as a prostitute once is, is probably good on the batting average side. Um, this comes from smiling too much. You don't smile at certain border crossings, you see. Okay, back to Tbilisi. So here we are trying to do some Internet connectivity across three countries, two of which are at war with each other over disputed territory, Nagorno-Karabakh, that would be Azerbaijan and Armenia. And we're thinking about what connects us and what... <laughs> Britney Spears concert. Uh oh, now I'm really in trouble. So we, you know, we're trying to think about what is meaningful connection. And I had brought a whole bunch of magic markers because, as uh, Dave truly appreciates, I love playing with the visual. And whoever did that drawing in the upper right-hand corner, it's brilliant. I suspect it might be Julia. Um, so I brought all these colored markers, and then interestingly, were these children's markers. In fact, maybe I should turn on the video because it's kind of worth worth some. Let's see, it's my um. Hold on. This is worth some uh, body language. So, okay. So these pens connected end to end. And, and it was interesting because the Armenians were sitting on one side of the U, the, the Azerbaijanis were sitting on another part of the U, and the Georgians were sitting on the U closest to the door because since they were in town, they kept on leaving. You know, they had to go to their office. And pretty soon, the Armenians had assembled the pens end to end. And then the Azerbaijanis were assembling the pens end to end, and pretty soon they connected it across the triangle of their two sets of tables. And my host goes, you can't believe the importance of what just happened. That, that they actually put these pens together is symbolic of their connection across their diversity, their conflict. And it was very interesting. It was when I understood that it's the ridiculously small things that have an incredible importance in our lives. And so I come on behalf of the ridiculously small. I come on behalf of the little practices, um, the wacky outliers, the doodlers. And um, so I don't pretend uh, a deep intellectual understanding of a lot of what I'm talking about. But instead, I, I'm thinking, yes, I'm thinking preschool. I'm thinking experience. And of what experiences that we can have together in this hour that actually inform our thinking, but more importantly, inform our practice as we think about this change 11 and learning and technology going into the future. So that's my invitation, is to think practical 
And to think small in the small is beautiful, Schumacher says, not in the small is insignificant sense. So, you know, sometimes it will be insignificant. So with that, um, I want to invite you into some things together. And uh, I have some, some, let's see, some bases upon which we can create. Yes, there's no suits, no ties. Um, I'm glad the floor is heated. If any of you are on the U.S. East Coast, your floor might not be heated. And Dave broke my slides, not because he broke my slides, but because I was not formatting carefully at 4 a.m. this morning when jet lag woke me up and I decided to change everything. So here we go. Um, let's see what we've got. Right. So my, my first intention, which actually you guys have warmed up the room so well, I think this is actually extraneous. But I learned a trick a long time ago from a woman named uh, Fernanda Ibarra from Mexico who showed me that there is so much ritual, rich ritual in our life offline that we can think about it online and it can make a difference. And she taught me the circle of chairs thing to use in um, a web meeting room. <clears throat> now this is why I like web meeting tools that allow everyone to draw on the whiteboard in which if I ever have a choice or control, I never want to use a web meeting tool that doesn't give everybody a chance to draw together. And listen, more than one can sit on the couch, okay? The couch has lots of room. Um, I, I like sitting on the floor, and so sometimes I just put myself someplace on the floor. And you can tell, this is going to be hard keeping up with visuals, the text, and trying to remain coherent. So if I'm going too fast or being incoherent, feel free to uh, take the microphone away from me um, and improvise. So go ahead and put yourself under a chair. I guess I should put myself under a chair. Um, and I'm just, right now I'm on so much tea and um, jet lag, it's probably problematic even choosing which chair to go to. So I'll face away, maybe that'll calm me down. Okay. So this idea of a circle is incredibly important. The ability to literally look across the circle from Eileen to Olavur, from Jason to, um, okay, I have to get rid of this little thing, to whoever has my chair, I'm looking to scroll down. I'm not used to this interface, and it slows me down a lot. John, John. And Chris being able to look at Lisa, who is graciously offering um, many places in her chair with other people. Now, Lisa's smart because sometimes cozy can be really nice, and sometimes we want to lose space. Um, a virtual circle allows us both. And, and Dave drew his own chair because, of course, he has to do his own thing, right? So here we are expressing identity, expressing something already in this little exercise of drawing together. And drawing together and having pens and paper or electronic whiteboard has turned out to be a practice change, a game changing practice for me. Um, and Sheena, just make sure you don't squish Kathleen. Um, but like I tell my granddaughter, I have a great laugh to sit in and she loves it. This, this idea that we bring our humanity to our electronic work. So, are we, are we done with chairs? No, we're not quite done. I'm going to move on, okay? Because pretty soon I'm going to devolve the microphone to everybody as well as, you know, the already the text on the whiteboard, so we'll go on. So we can I I ignore this because you've already gotten um, the day's wonderful warm-up slide, so we don't need to put our zombie thing in. I guess I saw this um, online this morning, and this is one of the things that had to go right into. Go back. You wanted a screenshot. Okay, hold on, Julia. I'll go back for you. Screenshot. You know you can also save screenshots at the end with Illuminate, or at least you used to be able to. Did you know that, Julia? You could go up to File, Save, and you can save the whiteboards. Um, oh, yeah, it's, it's, in the, it's in the Illuminate file formula. Yeah, okay. You done? Can I go forward? I usually go back and take screenshots at the end if, if Dave lets me stay in the room. Okay. So if I'm sad and discombobulated, you're right, I am. Forgive me, guys. I've been on the road um, all but four days since September 11th. So, yes, yeah, detach the text chat. That's if you have a nice big monitor day. So, anyway, have I confused you yet? Give me a smiley face if I haven't confused you yet. Um, okay. Even little smiley faces have moved around. You know, it's amazing how it feels when someone changes an interface on you. It's quite disarming. I saw this poster on the Occupy Together site, and I just loved it because it is the point. I wanted to make is I'm not trying just to be disruptive by saying let's draw on the screen or be different because it's cute um, or be an outlier because it's fun to be the outlier, but to really bring 
to the table that process is an incredible part of what we do when we learn together online, when we work together online or offline, and it's worth reflecting on it. And again, in, in terms of the process, it's usually little things. So I was then looking at the Change 11 compilation email that came in, and I thought, it's sweet. that sound was my, something falling off my desk, don't worry about that, from uh, between Jeff, Jeffrey and John Mack. And um, I was thinking about what, it is, what is it that changes us? And I like this tweet between, or this tweet conversation between the two of them, because it, it engaged me, and it had the more I want to know and share. This is this know and share part. There's something about that energy that I love. And while I can't talk about it so much intellectually, I can tell you it's what makes the difference when I'm working and learning with other people, that I want to know and I want to share. And what makes I want to know and I want to share happen? So I want to ask you now is, <laughs> hi, Jackie. Uh, sometimes if I have enough caffeine or enough sleep, maybe I could do that. So. So I, I invite you now to think about drawing a smiley face exactly who I put the circle there. Bless you. You just took exactly the cue I want. And give me a little sketch face of how you feel when things are changing around you. Okay. Now, I'm going to pull the screen away from you just for a second, and I'm going to come right back. So don't be disturbed. I want to say here's a few little visual ways to cheat if you're uh, not at all comfortable drawing faces. So take just a second to look. Up in the left is Austin Cleon's famous 3x3. Uh, three three. He actually does some larger ones than this one, but this is the one that fit here. Grid that's just simply using um, an inverted or a U or a line. You can totally change the faces. And then Dave Gray, who shows with a tiny mark, and particularly eyebrow action, can help express yourself. So just look at that for a minute, and then I'll go back to the page. Okay. Okay, so how do you feel when things change around you? Go for it. God, you guys are tremendously, tremendously uh, talented. Okay, so I'm seeing some very interesting things. I'm seeing an upside down person. I see an oh no. Um, it's interesting how many smiles there are here. Um, if we if we hear, yeah, Jeffrey says <laughs> most people I know claim to like change, but that does not mean changes to their own routine. Okay, so we are people. Then perhaps a generalization may be that interested in change. Um, but clearly less fear and angst than you might feel across the, the, the general population. Yeah? Or, you know, um, is it about that, is it when things change around you or when you change? How would your picture change if it was when you, when you have to change or somebody makes, makes you change? Would, would your picture be any different? I'll, I'll give up the mic and see if anybody has a comment on that. The idea of things changing around me means I have to respond, whereas me changing things is exciting. Yeah, Lisa, this, this issue of control. Um, and if I read back through some of the MOOC things, the Change 11 MOOC things, um, 
I, I didn't see a lot about power and control, and I was kind of curious whether those conversations had happened, because obviously I have not been keeping close tabs. Has there been much talk about power and control? Not from a policy perspective, perhaps, but more directly? Is it meaningful change? Yeah. Brainy Smurfs, I wonder if we're thinking about the MOOCs or learning in general, so I didn't really give much context. Jeffrey, I don't even know what not much from a Foucauldian perspective means. Can you explain that to me? <laughs> George, of course. I'm laughing again. Self-controlled learning. Brainy Smart, can you say more about self-controlled learning? Because um, I, could, I could interpret that word self-control in lots of different ways. I mean, individuals are controlling, controlling their learning, um, but they're not in control. Self-directed. Okay, Carol. That that was help. That was a helpful reframe for me as well. Self-directed versus self-controlled. False. Oh, we. Oui. I can speak you my seven French words: uh, croissant, chocolat. But I can't. I don't know Foucault. Foucault. I'm not even pronouncing his name right. Okay, I'm going to get myself in trouble here if I go philosophical. So, I use my own self-control in how much time I spend or not. Yeah. Okay, so if we think about change from the perspective of it's controlled by me or I have agency in it, we seem to be quite happy. Um, would it be safe to say when someone else controls or changes you, you may be less happy? And if that is true for you, um, use the smiley uh, the approval button, and if it's not true for you, use the disapproval button. And for those of you who are lost with interface, it's just in, in the participant quadrant, just below your name in this little drop-down box. Well, but I'm hearing my Twitter make tweety sounds. I have to look and see if someone's tweeting about this. Can I manage all this at once? Probably not. Okay. Talk down. It's interesting. How many inputs can you handle? Is that is that change you can handle? Managing chaos. Oh, you're X casting on DS one oh six too. Please rephrase the question. Okay. Um how do you feel about change when it's coming from multiple directions and multiple inputs so much like right now I'm looking at your chat, the screen, the scrolls, the tweets? A mess. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Explain something that doesn't change with someone. Huh, George, that's a good question. Trajectory. Okay. I'm going to have to go read this whole chat afterwards. It's overwhelming. To, so give me an example of, of the generative value of overwhelming. Because I happen to agree with you, but I'm curious with what you'd say. And I'm going to I'll get off the mic, too, if you want to talk. I see a moving X. Okay. <laughs> okay. For a second, take your hands off the keyboard. Stick your hands over your head. Stretch your back. Don't type. Don't draw. Okay. Did that hurt? <laughs> don't don't type. Don't draw. Roll your shoulders. Okay. Now. I'm in, in, uh, yeah, I'm controlling you. Absolutely. Don't type. <laughs> now, take 30 seconds, and I'll time it, and scroll back into the text and pick out one thing that really stands out for you. And Dave, would you insert a blank slide for me while I time? Because I can't look at the clock and insert a blank slide at the same time because I'm not that talented.
Okay. Um, I'm going to put a line here. Okay. Anything that really stood out for you in the chat, take a note of over here. And anything that stood out from you from the silence itself, take a note over here. Let's see what let's see what we experienced. So Wally, just so you know, uh, we're, we're doing a little reflection on the whiteboard. <laughs> if you join a room and it's dead silence, you think, uh-oh, what happened? Uh-oh. <laughs> Played Brian, you know, during the silence. Ooh, silence and radio. Silence and radio. Silence and webinars. Silence and text. It's an interesting space. One of the things as a talker, I. I I think by talking, and often you can tell by what comes out of my mouth that it's still half-baked, is that silence is a very challenging practice to bring into my life. But it also allowed me to go back and see the, the stream of consciousness that was amazing in the text as well. The richness that was in there is that probably few of us fully processed. And I wonder what that means. And I wonder what we do with that. And look at somebody's organizing it, too. Look at that. That's so nice. And I'm wondering when someone's going to come in and disrupt the organization because I just sense that this is a group of people who are talented like that. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I'm a doodler. And, and uh, as Chris pointed out in a uh, comment on my blog post, wonderful Sunny Brown uh, video on doodling. And uh, I can grab that URL and bring it back. <clears throat> I'm going to move to the next slide, and I'm telling you, um, also because my throat is going away here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, just so that I don't disrupt someone who's in something incredibly important that they're drawing. Thanks, Chris. Um, so if you want me not to move the page, grab the microphone and tell me or get me to stop, otherwise I'm going to change the page. Okay. So. We catch up with the changes. Yeah, exactly. So, ironically, that's the next question I have for you. It's about this, how do I find this place in the flow of all this change that is most productive for me? And one way of looking at it, simply only one, so this is just kind of a curiosity point, is the number of places I'm interacting. And one of the things that came up really strongly in the work with the Digital Habitats book was the increasing number of places that people are participating and the challenges that pre present. Um, it's not that you want to centralize, but the question is, is how do you make sense across your multi-membership in many places? And the MOOC is absolutely a brilliant playground to play with this idea, and people have written some really wonderful things. Um, it, 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 how do we find that flow between the diversity that the network gives us and our ability to engage with a meaningful depth with each other. So think about the axis with um, uh, the vertical, as about to say the up and down. You can tell I've got really great um, uh, <laughs> control of my language this morning. Um, you know, think I can, you know, the bottom, I can't maintain any kind of change uh, and, and still work productively, which, you know, I'm, I'm guessing very few of you would put yourself down there as compared to the number of places I'm interacting. So um, let's just make some kind of arbitrary thing of saying this is, um, this is come on, little drawing tool. 
place. You can go to this dry little town. There's one place, and let's say this is, um, anybody want to say what's your upper limit of places online that you regularly interact with? 20? Is that a good number? Yeah, twice. Not at one single instance, but over the course of your week. Five. Okay, we'll put let's do that. Five will be right about here then. Five. Ten. This is not a really brilliant fifteen. Okay. So think about where on this continuum is your sweet spot, or if you have more than one. And think about whether you have one or um, no worry. No worry, Brainy Smurf. It was actually very kind of you. Um, Jeffrey, I don't know what, how I would distinguish between sources or actual sites and locations. If I think about, uh, just play in zero, okay, we'll put zero over here. Um, if we think about sources of information, um, I'd still want to know if there's people involved. So I think uh, I'm, I'm thinking about people and the conversation. So Twitter might be the place you read to. That's a good question. I don't know how to answer these great questions. Like 20 people, okay. So um, why don't you decide, and then we can debrief based on how you choose. Because clearly you guys have immediately, oh, a bird just ran into my window. Sorry, bird. Um, that, that this is a much more complex thing than a simple little <laughs> what context. Of course, Jay Patton, context is what matters. Absolutely. So let's, let, let's, put some, let's put some constraints around this to make it more productive. In your own personal learning network, um, where in this continuum is your sweet spot? And someone really has uh, already mapped out their full continuum. <laughs> Jeffrey, you don't have to behave. Isn't that the point of having me as a guest is this is the time you don't have to behave? <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh on a recording. Oh, actually, I want to change that. Okay. The swamp thing from Fraggle Rock. You know, it does kind of look like the Fraggle Rock thing. Jeffrey, what would you mean by productively? Grab the microphone. Tell me what you think. There. Um, but productively, what I was thinking is um, how much can still really help you do whatever you're trying to do um, without distracting from the things that you need to do or need to get done. I think that's a really good definition, and I would add one more thing, and it's finding that balance between being too, fo being too focused so that you don't catch on from the diversity or the serendipity that the network brings, or being too much out there catching the serendipity uh, and diversity with the network brings that you don't get anything done. So for me, there's this really interesting place between um, kind of the task and the learning that can happen both within and around and outside of the task, if that makes any sense. <laughs> what's going on? I don't know what's going on. Let's see. Okay. For, for me, this, this question about what is a place is really significant. Because um, we have things like Facebook and Twitter, which are platforms that create place for us. Um, but we begin to identify them because of our experiences within them as places. So Twitter is my really important network uh, transversal tool. It helps me connect across diverse audiences, whereas um, maybe going to the blogs of the people that I follow regularly is a much more Defined space. Okay, I'm going to move to the next slide, holding in mind that we've got a lot of questions here, a lot of uh, either complexity or chaos, depending on how you like to define things, and I'm not going to go there right now. But clearly, a lot of diversity, but 
not a lot of clarity about what we need. So that's okay. Let's hold that for a second. And um, oh, I, I see. Dave, you know I'm going to transversal eventually because you've seen the slide. So um, let's think of this from a, from a very different way of simply your response to something. What makes change for you a pleasure and what makes it a pain? And you don't have to, you don't have to type the why. Or we'll discuss the why. And I encourage people to either to type or to talk because I'm getting tired of hearing my own voice. So I love hearing other people's voices too. I need some audio stimulation here. The pain is the pleasure and the pleasure. Okay, is that math, math, mathism? I'm trying to read the yellow writing and I'm having difficulty reading it. If someone can interpret it for me. I'm going to read quick in the audio here to get somebody else in. Um, for me, it's it's always a bit of both, right? I mean, uh, anytime you go through the change process, because it's never one instant of change, it's always sort of a process, because there's always bunches and pieces, so it flips back and forth. I enjoy the creativity part of change and the, and the immediate demand for action, whereas I find the need to reassemble things painful, because there's so many pieces to grab hold of. Thanks. Yeah, for me, it's that kind of sense-making thing, like flossing one's teeth or getting a knot out of one's back. <laughs> I like that. So, Rob, you know, talk about this productivity thing a little bit more, because I, I'm feeling a really strong tension lately between productivity and moving at a slower pace that actually increases my understanding and reflection. And it's challenging me, and I'm just curious whether that's what you mean by productivity. So feel free to grab the mic if you've got it or type. I guess it depends on what you mean by productivity. If you mean that you've got a specific task that you're trying to achieve, then maybe massive amounts of input becomes a distraction. But if you're trying to get a general idea of what's going on, then you need as much as you can get. Someone else was grabbing the mic there? I'm hearing and reading, I think, is that tension is actually the thing we're working with. Is it's not just about pain or pleasure, but it's about finding the place that, that uh, uses both of those for our learning or um, productivity and this kind of openness or spaciousness that may do different things for us. Oh, God, I think it's the birds. I've got two more birds just ran into my window. The birds! And they're crows. Is it Halloween? You stress. What is you stress? Jackie, tell us. Rob, I'm sorry your mic's not working. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I think there's definitely power to it. It's not like one thing is good or bad. In fact, pleasure or pain are probably wrong words to look at this. But it's balancing that tension. It's like thinking about how do we use it in a productive way. So I'm going to go to another slide, if that's okay. If you can keep talking about this, because it's related. You can keep going. Is Okay, so we, we think about those things that, the what. Now think about people in your life for whom, no, I mean, let me put that in English. Um, people in your life who help make change useful for you, productive, particularly in the context, context of learning. And who makes it a pain?
I'm uh, I'm laughing at the George on the orange line. Who just joined the session? Uh, that won't let the silence alarm me. Yes, the audio is working. We're just reflecting a little bit on the role of people in our change and learning in technology. So it's interesting. It seems to be um, some of that control thing again. Uh, certainly, some of the ambiguity and balancing tensions with George there in the middle. Um, it's very interesting how many people have themselves on both sides. <laughs> Paying the people I love, wow. This is also what happens when you ask a question. It, it may have uh, triggered something in people that I can't see what's going on behind, and I'd love to have a conversation around each one. Does anyone want to grab the mic and say why they put what they put where they put it? I'll, uh, I'll jump in for a second, Nancy, if that's okay. I find that the biggest change for me, I see bureaucratic policy, policy enforcers on the right. The more that I, I've been involved in trying to manage change and trying to, and I really do mean manage, like how do you try to make sure that it lasts and encourage an ecosystem where it can grow, the more I've become sympathetic to the bureaucratic end of it, not necessarily simply enforcing policy, but how change is really um, it, it's really vulnerable, right? It's, it's, it breaks really easily, and how you need to put so many things in place and, and listen so much to the experience that you, you see of other people who have done this kind of change before to try to um, put the, and I find that's the hardest part, is trying to look at people and say, you know, if you want to do this change, you know, you look out over time and what's going to happen and what the challenges are. That's, always, that's sort of where I always am in that, in that pain pleasure place. Mm -hmm. It's interesting when you talk about that. You remind me of this importance of the role of, tra of, the, of the transversal because, well, you guys, it seems to me, embody, or we guys, all of us, because I, I, I put myself in the same bucket, is embodying this ability to go out and learn and apply and innovate and work and do in a very self-directed way. Going back to that that comment early on about self-direction or self-control. Um, we work in institutions, contexts, organizations where that may not be the default behavior and certainly where the institutional structures have not wanted that to be the default behavior or certainly not encouraged it, in fact may have even punished it. And one of the things that really shows up, for example, in my communities of practice work is that we need to start actually knitting across that very independent, free-range, self-directed way of working and the realities of our institutions. And so that role of the transversal, of someone who can work up, down, left, right, becomes a really important person for me in terms of making change productive and positive rather than being an assault upon my senses, something imposed upon me. So. Thinking about the transversal role, and Dave, it sounds like you're playing the transversal role in your um, organization, Lisa. <laughs> subversion may be your way of being a transversal, and, and transverse work can be subversive, or it can be, you know, an other, many other descriptors. And I would presume that we need all of those things, but think about who specifically, think about a person, you know, to type it down here, that actually helps make this transversal work. Someone who can communicate across perhaps those different ways of seeing the world. Uh, Lisa, I'm not sure it's always about tact, okay? Um, you know, I'm not good at talking to executives, but I'm really good at talking to middle managers because I can talk in a very pragmatic and practical way. I don't have to speak the blah blah speak of the upper level management. 
I would not say I'm tactful, but I think I'm straightforward enough that it makes sense at that level. So in that case, I can work as, as a transversal. And it's still somewhat subversive. And, you know, to go back to that uh, story I told you about uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia, they didn't finish telling the story because I'm very easily distracted today, like, you know, a flea, was that pretty soon we had the managers of the three country offices who did have connectivity, they were among the 5%, being able to give each other feedback and start taking actions without waiting for the incredibly slow communication cycle, which was Vermont, which was send an email to Vermont, and I kid you not, email printed out, given to the person it was for, they wrote an answer on a piece of paper, they give it back to the, um, uh, the support staff who types it in the email, and so you get an answer in, you know, maybe 48 hours. And these people started making decisions on their own and started doing things with people that were available and present in front of them that they could act upon in, I must say, a pretty unstable post-Soviet uh, environment. And pretty soon they were doing things that were so amazing that they actually started getting additional support from their funders. But not before the people in Vermont had said, um, what, that Nancy White you've hired, is she some kind of a cult leader? And this is where my son decided that uh, my job description was overthrowing small countries. Um, but the fact is, sometimes people just need a little bit of affirmation to liberate their ability to do um, to do something really successful. Um, VH, uh, I don't know how to say your name when I'm reading this, but VH, a student, I'm curious, what have been some really, <laughs> you have a cult, George, come on, overthrow Canada, and then I, I think, as Jeffrey said, we probably have some overthrow issues in the United States we have to do, like, um, I'd love to know some of your tips about how to be a transversal with upper management because I often managed to put my foot into it. And um, Jay Patton, I do think you've actually come to one of the core parts is empathy. And where I can empathize may be different than where you can empathize and maybe in a d diplomacy. Huh. Hmm. Maybe I better go learn diplomacy. Empathy and trust building. Yeah, um, I have to tell you, I'm also a fan of working in a place where trust may not yet be present and giving unilaterally offering trust, even if it's not necessarily immediately accepted on the other side. <laughs> Maybe that's authenticity. Sugar, no eating. <laughs> um, another one that I use is holding up a mirror to someone else. It just Sometimes people just don't see their tremendous value and ability in the world for whatever reason. And it just takes someone else to say, ah, look here, near. Look what you just did was amazing. Yeah, and ask for help. So it's very interesting. When I see the things that you're putting here, um, you know, that is a way to fall into that power trap. Rob, are we talking about helping people create value for themselves? That's a good question. For me, it's not just that, but it's also about for me, being of value is the value I want to create for myself. So that's probably the trap I fall into, but it's a really important question you're asking. So I'm curious what Rob's going to answer to Brainy Smurf. I'm watching. I'm watching. <laughs> okay. So the things you guys are typing, if you took like the last 60 lines, to me you would have a wonderful set of practices which is about being present in a facilitative manner versus a directive manner. And by facilitate, I don't mean facilitate. And I think it's, for me, as I get older, the, the concept of helping someone is actually a very dangerous concept, but creating conditions that allow people to flourish. So um, it's, it's very interesting. I love this stuff. I'm just sitting there nodding. I should have turned the video on. I'm like this little duck. I'm nodding at everything you're typing. Okay. So looking at the clock, I'm going to move ahead because I want to talk about a couple little things. Yes, agree. I think helping, helping. I work in international development. Let me tell you, help is a dangerous word. Okay. So 
So stipulate, F-A-C-I-P-U-L-A-T-E, which is uh, my interpretation of often what we do as facilitators. We actually manipulating. Um, and, you know, sometimes manipulation is an effective strategy, but I would not recommend it as the default way of living in the world. Type it out, yo. Okay. Hold on. F-A-C-I-P-U-L-A-T-E. Okay. If I spelled it correctly. My helping is your bossing. Yeah, could be. Okay. On to the next page. So we just started introducing this idea of the transversal. And there's two roles that I'm really just absolutely intellectually engaged with right now. And one is the social artist, and this comes from Etienne Wenger's work, but it resonates with the work of a lot of other people, um, which is, it, and he, he defines it as people who help create social learning spaces where people can work together on social issues. Now, I, I would actually take David Wilcox's interpretation back a step and just leave off on social issues, um, because I think it is, this idea of creating a space that people engage with each other. So um, a quality of a social artist is people feel listened to, okay, or they feel heard. Um, people are invited into engagement, conversation. So as Dave opened up a whiteboard and started drawing howling pictures, he, and he was he was living the role of social artist, and Dave, I think, is good in the role of social artist. Um, Julia Forsyth, I'm going to pick on you, who does this kind of cross-media thing with radio and Twitter and visuals. So it invites different kinds of perspectives on the topic or the domain that people are doing. Yes, he's definitely more than a social artist, George, I would agree. But I think one of his qualities is as a social artist. Um, that these are these are people who notice the world notice the world in a particular way and act upon it that allows us to engage with each other. And they are usually unofficial roles. In fact, I haven't yet seen really successful instantiation of that. Why did I use that word? Um, I haven't seen it as a formalized role that well at all. But they're incredibly important in this open learning. Um, do you think it's possible to transfer it? Uh, you know, Jane, I hope it is, okay? If it isn't, we're so, so screwed. Um, and that when we, when we can't use polarity generatively, when polarity just pulls us further and further apart, it's like, it's really hard. Gonistic, okay. It goes to all these new words. Woo! Woo! I have a friend who likes to make up new words. I'm going to have to save this for him and share it with him. It's, it's an Aunt George was like a Ford. Yeah, I learned affordances from um, uh, Howard Rheingold, and it, I, I swear it took me a, a year to understand that. And the other word that took me a while to have trouble with was um, reification from Etienne Wenger. And now it's a really useful word that I really struggled with, but I'm not quite sure. Okay. Yeah, you know, okay. So do we want to talk politics? We can talk politics because I'm going to get sucked into this one. And I have to be careful about getting sucked in. But maybe that's good. Maybe that's what we should do. You know, um, Jeffrey, we can talk about that. Let's have a conversation about that, another one, because otherwise I'll get us really distracted, because I'm already distracted, as you can tell. God, I hope there's no one who's really linear in this group, because I'm probably making you crazy. This sting. Oh, Julia, that's sad. Yep. Words always create distance. Yeah. But they can also create closeness. Both. Okay. I'll let you go. It. We need a reification. Okay. So we'll do a reification hangout. So social artists. That's, that's one thing I want to put in here. And the other is this person who's the transversal who can really work across the power gradient. So maybe it's the diplomat or the subversive, and I think it's both. Because if you look at some of the definitions of transverse, there's also a disruptive part of it. But it's about thinking not just in the group of people like us who are having fun together in a conversation, but how that connects to other people and other things. So connecting in more than just a social network way and social and working the social side of things in a way that's very human and, and very engaging. Okay? Yeah, some of us are polarizers and you know I also believe there's a role in the world for polarizers to a degree. Um, it's like none of it should be taken to the extreme. It's like the ecosystem of behaviors. <laughs> Coffee party. I love the chocolate party. Okay, so this is where um, one of the slides got kind of funky, so I thought of being really clever and putting that pointing new finger behind you. So just imagine that pointing new finger behind you. So uh, can this be learned or be born with it? 
I think it can be learned, but I think some people are born with it. How's that for a, a fuzzy, a fuzzy one? I'm reading. Okay. I'm glad you take that fuzzy response. Um, I'm, you know, some of those things I'm getting better at, but the thing that worries me is some of these things I'm getting worse at because of some of my beliefs changing. So. <laughs> Okay. This is beautiful. So, uh, Jeffrey asked an important question, and, okay, Courtney rap song. Um, it is hard to do audio and visual at times sometimes. So, it, it was undefined in Change 11 Luke as well. Okay. That's fair. Um, it's interesting. Um, uh, well, I just love, uh, someone just crossed out their open mind. There's so much to process here, I've got to come out and, and process it again later. But I want to be respectful for those of you who have to leave at the, no, you don't have to define the Lisa, don't worry. So for those of you who have to leave the top of the hour, I just to, to come to a couple of, uh, the invitation I'd like to leave you with is, um, and, well, actually, Jeffrey, this was the slide you were waiting for, and I'm going to skip it. <laughs> no, maybe I shouldn't skip it. Can I run a few minutes long? Is that okay? I have the power. No, you don't. You have the power because you leave. Okay. So, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go five minutes over. Um, it, and and if you have to leave, I totally understand it. But really, to think about when we think about social artists and transversals, when we think about where change is comfortable for us or uncomfortable or useful or not useful, or who plays a role in that, what does that mean in the context of teaching and learning? Um, what practical application does this have for you? Any? You know, this is kind of a 
millions of words evolving on the screen. They go from left to right. It's, it's just all of a sudden I had a sort of poetic experience of watching your words. To every phrase. Um, when we thought about all these wide open, squishy, wishy things, is there anything practical that you can pull out of that for your teaching and learning? What practice might it uh, suggest? Bye, Dave. We have to debrief sometime, okay? I'm happy to pull out, uh, Jeffrey. Probably have to pull out sort of asynchronously because I'm facilitating in the middle of the week. Okay. Oh, I like this. So we have this. Now we've got the vertical part of the dance coming in. Reflect on language. Accelerate change. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> Allow space. Uh -huh. Vertical must have been hard. It's kind of hard to read, but I like how it transacts. It was very transversal, actually. <laughs> you visually represented the concept with a textual response. You know, I think vertical is hard. It's kind of a meta thing, too. Yes. I, I'd like to propose another synchronous session at the end of the week, um, but I didn't get a chance to ask Dave um, if that would be okay. Oh, no, please do not do a hardware diagnostic on my computer machine. Sorry. Um, but if uh, I'm grabbing my calendar. Maybe we do it at the same time on Friday. I could do it at the same time on Friday. Would that work for you guys? Brandy Smurf, you know something? This is, here's my transversal strong reaction to your comment, collaboration so much easier than engaging hierarchy. What I'm understanding is that sometimes collaboration is about engaging hierarchy. <laughs> okay, so Friday, the same, freak, same Freaky Friday time, um, the same thing, because there's a lot to chew on here, because I want to leave you with an invitation, which you could change, ignore, um, engage in, but I'm really interested in the who are doing these practices of social artists and working the transversal. Um, because I want to hear their stories. Ooh, 1 a.m. in Singapore. Peggy, my goodness. Ah! Um, you know, I'd love to hear stories of people doing this, of real work. So we take it from this kind of lovely stew pot of ideas and words and visuals to some stories of actual practice. So that could be one invitation for Friday. If not, you drive the agenda, I'll play the game. Um, and I'm just blown away by you guys because really I came in here half ass prepared and you have taught me so much. And um, the, 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 the origin, as far as I know, is Etienne. Um, the work of the, the transversal comes from lots of different people. Um, Lurkster, I'm glad you kicked back in. Okay? Um, see you on Friday. Let me type this in here so those of us who are brain challenged, look us see. Friday at, okay, I put this in different time zones, 9 a.m. Oh, we have all this problem of time zones changing and not changing. So let me get that in. GMT would be. Would that be 5 p.m. GMT, or am I still screwing that up because of all the daylight saving time? Someone, let's, let's check that. Okay. Yeah, U.S. doesn't change till Sunday, but all the people, it's 4 p.m. GMT. Okay. Let's fix that right now. I'm having real trouble with the drawing tool today. Nancy? Yeah, what we can do with this as well is uh, when we send out the email, we'll post the time in there. We need to just use little date and time to link it so people can click on that as well. Fabulous. Okay, so what I would love to do for those who have one more minute is play a game called Just Three Words in the chat box, Just Three Words that Express Your Experience of the Last Hour Together. Quick debrief and then... Um, more on blogs and Twitter and everything else. Just three words.
and not even that she could buy a feed of in all that good stuff. Well, thanks, Nancy, for uh, obviously, as you can tell from the responses and you can tell from the activity on the whiteboard during your presentation, thanks for a, an engaging, uh, inspiring, motivating, high-energy presentation. I think it was uh, definitely great to see some of the creativity that's in the room unleashed. And so in Dave's absence, I'll just say a quick thank you. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak, and we will uh, see you again on Friday, it looks like. So thanks all. End the recording there. and. You can just join me in giving Nancy a round of applause. That would be great. Thanks. That was awesome, Nancy.